Um, okay. Well, thank you very much um, to the organizers first for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, so I want to talk about topological properties of multi-terminal chosen junctions. Um, today, I start by um, uh, thanking my um, co-workers. So all of this work has then uh, been done together with my colleague in Bruno Manuel Rousset. We started a couple of years ago with um, Yuli Nassarov, who was visiting at the time, and a postdoc, Roman Rivar. And the most recent work um, in brokers that I'm going to talk about today is then um, in collaboration with um, Pianet, who was a postdoc and is now a um, permanent researcher in Grenoble. Um, so the idea is that I'm not, I don't want to talk about real materials, but what I'd call um, synthetic materials. And then this, we want to use um, multi-terminal Josephs and junctions to make an artificial material. And I'll um, explain you um, the analogy in the first slide. The advantage maybe being that it's more, uh, it's simpler to control than a real material and to engineer the properties that you want um, to look for. So the idea is basically if you um, create just a simple um, Josephs and junction, meaning you um, have two superconductors that are separated by no, some non-superconducting material. The superconductors have a gap, but in the junction, you may form bound states with an energy that is smaller than the gap. And the energy of these bound states actually depends on the phase difference between your two superconductors. So you have something like a band structure where you have an energy band um, that is periodic in this superconducting um, phase difference. So if you have just the two terminal Josephson junction, it's a one-dimensional band structure. You have one phase difference. If somehow you manage to connect multiple superconductors to some se same central non-superconducting region, the bound states in this central area may depend on all of the phase difference. So if you have n terminals, you have n minus one um, phase difference. So if you have an n minus one dimensional band structure in this material. So that's the analogy we want to use. The Andreev spectrum in a Josephson junction is our pseudo band structure where the phase differences um, between the superconductors play the role of quasi momenta. So again, N terminals makes an N minus one dimensional band structure. Of course, these are not the same as quasi momenta because they're external parameters. So in some sense, we do single particle physics. We don't have a Fermi C. We have a given value of phases at a given point. And if you want to probe something for the entire band structure, you have to vary the applied phase differences to the material. So what can we do with that? Well, we can look just as the energy bands, but you can also ask about what we do with usual materials. Is there some topological properties in these artificial uh, materials? So what we um, studied in the beginning, and it's the simplest example actually, is if you look at a four terminal Joseph's junction, just use conventional superconductors, so nothing topological about the materials we use, and look at the Andreev spectrum in such a junction. So you have three phase differences, and what we showed what can get is um, an analog of what one might call a vial semi-metal, where you have a topologically protected crossing between two Andreev states, and particularly interesting are the crossings that are at the Fermi level, and the Fermi level is special again because we have particle hole symmetry in the system. So unusual light semi-metals crossing can happen at any energy. Here, particle hole symmetry makes the Fermi level um, a special point. So you can have um, an analog of a vine semi nettle Now here, um, even though this looks like a three-dimensional material, you can choose how many phases you actually consider as parameters and what, um, and you can um, go down from a 3D material to a 2D material, material by just fixing one of these phases and considering as say a mass term. And then if you, fix it on either side of such a vine point. I think someone <laughs> um, is characterized by churn number. And this churn number changes as you vary your control phase um, across um, this vine crossing. So you can have a two dimensional churn insulator where the ground state on one side of um, this crossing will have a finite churn number. And then a finite churn number usually in a 2D system is associated with this edge state and a quantum Hall effect. And you can ask whether you get the analog here. 
Note, however, we don't have edge states. In some sense, this is an infinite system because the system is really periodic and phi, and we don't have to conjugate variable to play with unless we want to play with charging, which we don't do um, at this point. We showed that even though we don't have edges, we actually can measure the churn number similar as in the quantum Hall effect by measuring a transconductance. In a way that's done somewhat differently, you apply voltages to sweep your entire Brillouin zone, so to vary the phases. So to explore really what happens for all the values of the phases, and it turns out that we get a whole conductance that's proportional to the churn number of this band structure, and I'll show this later. So the new work that I want um, to talk about today as well is, well, this is an example for topological band structure in Joseph's and Junction's, um, is there more? We know that in real materials, there's a whole host of uh, possible topological phases in different um, dimensions characterized by difficult, uh, different topological invariants. So even uh, there's a um, table which tells you, depending on the symmetries of the system under time reversal, particle hole, and a chiral symmetry, what are possible phases in which dimension. So the question is then analog for the for choices and junctions. And it turns out it's not the same table because even though my say my phase difference are an analog of quasi momenta, they actually don't behave the same way under these symmetries. So the classification will be different. And so we can possibly have different topological phases in different symmetry classes than in real materials. And um, the, the other, but let's say, advantage of um, this realization is that we are not limited to three dimension. In principle, we can attach as many terminals as we want to the system and ask for um, topological phases in four, five, six dimensions. Now, something I won't talk about today, but I'll flash it because we have a flat band in this cases. Um, if you don't use um, top of, uh, conventional superconductor, but you make a con um, Josephson junction with um, topological superconductors, the 1D, the type chains basically that um, Kikan talked about in this tutorial, you get a different kind of band crossing, which now involves three band. You have two finite energy bands. And the flat band, which is basically a single Majorana that's um, staying at the Fermi level in the three terminal junctions. And what we showed that in this case, um, our 2D band structure is always non trivial. So, in this kind of topological three terminal junctions, one would always get a finite transconductance. Now, um, what's the experimental situation? So, the, the things I'm talking about haven't been measured yet, but um, multi-terminal junctions is something that people can realize, and there's more and more groups that are realizing um, them today. So I'm showing several examples with um, different materials. The first one is a metallic junction, which is probably um, not the best way to uh, look at the physics um, we are looking for, because it, um, the number of Andreev states, and therefore the level spacing in this junction, depends on the number of channels that connect the different superconductors. And if we want to probe properties of individual and states, we need a level spacing that's sufficiently large. So we want for instance, to have a chan uh, junction with um, few channels, which can hopefully achieve either in um, two dimensional materials, where can, you can um, you have fewer channels or even taking wires that connect your superconductor. So, um, Here's my outline. I want to say a few for what is this unfair spectrum and how do we study it? Then um, briefly review what we saw in um, conventional four terminal junctions where um, there's clear evidence for this um, topological properties and then come to this classification and possible mean phases in um, these systems. So um, the basic um, process that leads to the formation of these unfair bound states is um, Andreev reflection. We have our superconductors, which have a gap in the excitation spectrum, so there's no quasi-particle excitations around the Fermi level. So if you want to transfer a particle into the superconductor, these energies, that's not possible as a single particle excitation. However, you can transfer a Cooper pair into the superconductor, which means you need to grab two electrons, or equivalently, you can say you take an electron and leave a hole behind. So you reflect an electron into a hole. This can happen with a single superconductor. It gets more interesting if you have um, two of them. So now I enclose some normal region between two superconductors. So I have an electron that gets Andreev reflected from this superconductor as a hole. Once the hole hits the other superconductor, it gets again Andreev reflected, this time extracting a Cooper pair and comes back as an electron. So Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization tells you, so now we 
have a closed loop if the acquired phase along this closed loop is a multiple of two pi we will actually get a state and the phase here has um, different contributions if the normal region is long enough you have a propagation phase i want to concentrate on the case where the normal region is fairly short and this propagation phase doesn't play a role so the wind phase comes from the andreas reflection there's a term that is just the phase of the superconductor this is picked up and there's an energy dependent term which basically uh, depends on how the, the eigenstates in the superconductor are a mixture of electrons and holes which turns with the, uh, the efficiency of this entry reflection so without the propagation phase in the normal region you get a very simple equation to solve and you find that you have a bound state that crosses all the way from the gap edge um, um, above the Fermi level to the gap edge below the, the Fermi level. So you have one Andreev state in the spell state, which um, process um, the entire energy gap. Well, I say you have one Andreev state, that's actually not true. Here I showed electrons moving in one direction. You always, if you have just a uh, 1D system, you will have the electrons also moving in the other direction. You get a second state um, from this additional process so you actually have two states or one doubly degenerate state which can also be very centered this way because the particle the system has particle hole symmetry so an um an electron state with um, a positive energy can always represent it as a whole state with negative energies so either you say you have a one doubly degenerate level or you have these two levels here related by particle hole symmetry that will cross at the Fermi level so here you have a crossing, but actually this crossing is not topological at all. As soon as you introduce any backscattering, these two states will get coupled and hybridized and a gap will open up. So in the conventional two terminal Josephson junctions, you won't have any states at the Fermi level. You will always have a gap in the energy spectrum. So what about multi-terminal junctions? So the way we study them is use a, a scattering formalism well, we actually can separate what happens at the interface with the superconductor where you have Andreas reflection and some normal region where you just have normal scattering. So that means, say you have an electron that comes from one of these superconductors. Once it hits the normal region, it can be scattered into any of the other superconducting leads. It depends on the, the matrix that we have to choose appropriately. Once it comes to the other superconductor, it will be Andreev reflected. Then the whole again will be scattered by this normal region and go back to the superconductor. So that means if you look at the wave functions in these links um, connecting the scattering region to the superconductor, you have four components. You have electrons going one way or the other way, and you have holes going one way or the other way. The electrons going different directions are connected by the normal scattering. Electrons and holes are connected by the Andreev scattering. So then you can show that you get. Well, if you have all these scattering processes, you get, go back to the same states, actually. And again, if it's really the same state or equivalent to what we said before, the phase, accumulated phase is a module of 2 pi, you will have a state. So you have, um, if this um, scattering matrix has an eigenvalue 1, you will form a state in the, the junction. And by using the properties of this um, to the scattering matrix, namely that normal scattering only connects electrons with electrons and Andreas scattering always connects electrons with whole, you can, this vector, which is at least four dimensional, depending um, on how many channels you have in your junction to something that has half of dimension, which is this equation. So here you see again, you have this um, energy dependent phase that I showed you before for the two terminal junctions. And now we have all the different phases for the superconductor. So dependent from what superconductor it gets reflected, it picks up the phase of that superconductor. So we have one equation that will uh, allow us, so it depends on phase and energy. So we have to find the relation between phase and energy such so yeah, that the eigenvalue is one, and that will uh, give us our Andreev um, spectrum. And um, before I said I want to concentrate on short junctions, the simplification for short junctions is that this um, scattering matrix doesn't depend on energy. Yes? Um, if the gaps would be different in different superconductors, then I would um, have to adjust these phase factors again also for the superconductors. So that for each of the superconductors, you get um, the, the, the corresponding phase factor with the gap of that superconductor. So the 
the specific of the spectrum obviously depends on the scattering matrix you choose. The generic properties is again, it depends on all, can depend on all of the, the phase difference. It has particle hole symmetry. And if we don't um, um, include some, some spin scattering or uh, spin, um, um, spin orbit coupling, all these levels will be doubly degenerate. So again, if we have four terminals, we can have a 3D pseudo vent structures. If we have two terminals or we fix one phase difference, we have a um, 2D um, pseudo vent structure. So now what can happen in these um, vent structures? Um, well, I told you already, I, I might want to look for, for vile semi-metals. So how do I get that? It's just, I have to ask about, um, do I get two bands to cross? And actually that's the only thing that, or the most simple thing that can happen at the Fermi level again, because we have particle hole symmetry, I can't just have a single band crossing the Fermi level. It necessarily is a crossing if I have a state um, at the Fermi level. Now, if I just look at a crossing of two bands, I can write an effective flow energy Hamiltonian. And since it's two band, I'll have a two by two Hamiltonian and any two by two Hamiltonian I can express in terms of Pauli matrices plus some constant term, which actually here will be absent because of particle hole symmetry. So you can't have a easy one. So that means I have three Pauli matrices. So I have three coefficients I need to tune to zero to get a crossing between these bands. So if I have three phases, I have enough parameters to tune my um, three um, parameters to get such a crossing. So that's why in three dimension, one can generally get a crossing without fine tuning of the junction. You don't need an additional parameter to get to this crossing. And once you have a crossing, while well, there are no additional terms you can add to your Hamiltonian, so you can't split it. You can shift it by putting perturbations on these Pauli matrices, but you can't split it. And that's because this is a topologically protected crossing. Actually, it has a topological charge, um, which depends on how these parameters depend on your, uh, on how the coefficients depend on your control parameters and can be plus or minus one if it's a linear crossing. Now, if you have such a crossing, um, as I said, then it uh, tells you also what happens if you take cuts to your three dimensional band structures. So the topological charge um, is uh, of these value points is related to Barry curvature. They're actually monopoles of, of Barry curvature. And Barry curvature is also what determines the churn numbers of a 2D system. So this monopole actually has a consequence that if you take cuts to your 2D, uh, to your 3D structure on either side of um, this point, the difference between the churn numbers on either side will be just the charge of this monopole that's enclosed between the two surfaces. So that means if you have a wild crossing necessarily on one side or the other of this crossing, your um, states will carry a finite churn number. On one side, it can be trivial, but on the other side, it will be necessarily non-trivial. So that means such a crossing will give a topological phase transition if you want. And then what you expect is edge states and a quantum hall effect if this was a real material. Now, first questions, do we, can you get that? Well, we can find scattering matrices where you can get such regressing. If we assume the system to be time reversal invariant, there will be at least four crossings if we have crossings because we always have two with the same charge that's related by time reversal symmetry and the total um, topological charge in the entire band structure needs to be zero. So there would be at least four wild points. And if you look at the churn numbers by taking cuts, the churn number jumps at every time you cross such a wild point. And you don't know, only know that it jumps, you also have a reference points actually if you're Phase the, uh, the, the control phase is zero. The entire system has time reversal symmetry. So you know, if you have time reversal symmetry, the churn number is necessarily zero. So you know, you start here from zero and then you can just consider the charges and really determine the churn number um, in other um, parts of, of the spectrum. So that's also why in the end here, I'm only, only talking about the Andreev state. Of course, my system has more states. There's a continuum outside of the gap. However, as these states don't cross the Fermi level, the, their topological 
pro, uh, content won't change as I change the control parameters. So I have this reference point where I know that the system is trivial. I can, by only looking at these low energy states, determine whether um, the entire system is trivial or non trivial. So, um, well, I said we can find scattering matrices. Actually, if you take just random scattering matrices possessing time reversal, um, about five of them will have um, such wild points. If I take terminals which have more than one channel, the number, the probability of getting wild point um, goes up very quickly and almost always find wild points in these structures. But again, as I told you before, the more levels I have in the junction, probably the more difficult it will be to see the properties of these levels. So even though the chance of getting the wild points is lower when you have fewer channels, it might be a better system to observe them in the end. So how to observe them? Well, you can do spectroscopy. It has been done in these junctions I showed you. <laughs> um, the entry of levels and just see the crossing. But it turns out um, you can measure the churn number um, similarly as in the quantum Hall effect. Namely, if you look at the current between different terminals, the, 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 the current is giving as the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the phase of the superconductor. Now, if the phases are constant, this gives you just your Josephson current, which um, is a, a phase dependent um, current. If you apply DC voltages, your terminals, you have the second Josephson relation, which tells you that actually the phases won't be constant anymore. They will wind with a velocity that's um, proportional to the applied voltage. So once you apply voltages, you will explore your entire um, band structure. So if this voltage is sufficiently small. You can compute the current by using the instantaneous eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. So you just take the, the states at a given well, at a time given by the value of the phase at a time, and you can um, compute the current with this. So you get the first term, which is just the AC Josephson effect. That means you just um, take your um, DC current phase relation and you substitute the time um, dependent phase, which gives you uh, an AC current. And you get a first correction, which is proportional to the velocity of the evolution of the phases. And the term that gives the proportionality here is the Berry curvature. So the instantaneous current in my Joseph's junction measures the local Berry curvature of um, my event structure. And um, well, if I want to see a churn number, I need to average over the entire um, pre zone. So I need to explore not the local Berry curvature, but the, the, the Berry curvature averaged over the entire um, pre zone. So I can either apply two incommensurate voltages, which means I will sweep all the possible phases, or I can just apply one voltage and then step the other phase with a magnetic flux. So in, in average the currents over that. So I will explore the Berry curvature throughout the entire um, pre zone. And that's what gives me, in the end, this um, conductance that's proportional to the churn number. So there is a way to measure these topological properties of my um, junctions. So before I showed you this picture where you have my um, um, bail points in the band structure, and I said this is related to the churn number, it is directly related to the strength conductance um, that you measure in the system. Of course, this is a small cycle on top of a large AC current. And the idea is really you need to average out this AC signal to get in the end only the DC contribution of this current. Um, if I have time in the end, well, I'll talk about why um, having not too many channels is important. And it's actually the same um, reason why uh, it's always important when you want to want to probe topological um, properties is you're interested in the property of the ground state. So if you manipulate your system, you need to probe the properties of the ground state and not excite the system um, and uh, see what happens in the excited bands where you lose um, this topological projection. It's always protected by some gap to an excited state. Now, this was an example. Um, and what we've been trying uh, since is to figure out, are there other examples? Well, we said, in principle, with these multiple terminal junctions, you have infinite possibilities because you can realize arbitrary dimensions. Um, this sort of is an analog of something that exists already. So what else can we um, hope to do? 
So the most recent work that's still work in progress is looking at a, a complete classification of what are the possible phases I can get in this multi-terminal junctions and then see if we can find other examples. So um, this is the table I have already showed, which classifies the usual um, topological phases in materials. And um, there are three columns in the beginning. So it depends on how, this, uh, if the system has time reversal symmetry or not, if it has particle hole symmetry or not. And um, finally, you can get a, a chiral symmetry, which um, if you have these two symmetries, it will just be, can just be the combination of the two. But even if these two symmetries are absent, you can still have a symmetry just under the combination. So that in total gives you 10 possibility because each of these symmetries can, um, in addition to being present or absent, square to one or to minus one. So you have this tenfold um, uh, symbol rather than classification, and it tells you um, whether you can or not have a topological phase um, with this symmetry and uh, in a given dimension. So the examples that Tigran talked about in um, his tutorial are the ones I'm showing here. So in class A, where you don't have any symmetries and two dimensions, you get a quantum Hall effect, which is characterized by a churn number. If you have time reversal symmetry, you can get a quantum spin Hall insulator, which is um, characterized by a C2 invariant. And um, the Kitaev chain, which is a topological um, superconductor in one dimension, again, is characterized by a C2 invariant. Now, this table here, while it's shown for three dimension because it's the dimension of real materials, it can actually be extended to arbitrary dimensions. Um, and arbitrary, actually, it's sufficient to go from zero to seven because after that, one has a periodicity. There's a what periodicity of eight. So um, from that, we can conclude um, the possible um, phases in all dimensions. Another thing that can be included as well is um, a classification of defect. If your Hamiltonian doesn't depend only on K, but you have a slow dependence on some variable R characterizing a defect in your system, um, the, um, the, posi so the position, position doesn't change sign under any of these symmetries. It turns out that this classification holds the same way and the relevant parameter is actually um, the difference between the total number of spatial dimensions and the uh, number, the dimensions um, of the surface that surrounds your defect. So the full table, considering just the symmetries, is the one given here. Now, coming to our system, and that's the only thing that didn't work when I transferred my presentation <laughs> to the other computer, this should be arrows as well. So the mysteries, it's the same arrows as here. <laughs> and this one didn't work. So while time reversal, um, actually changes the sign of the phases as in a, it would for a quasi-momentum K. The system as a superconductor has particle hole symmetries at a given value of the phases. So the phase doesn't change sign on the particle hole symmetry. So in that sense, it behaves differently from a momentum variable. So that means if I want to, and as a consequence, since the chiral symmetry will be the combination of the two, it will also different, behave differently under this chiral symmetry. So this kind of um, parameters actually has been studied before for some example by Shang and Kane, we call it an anomalous parameter. So it doesn't behave as it should under the combination of these symmetries. And um, there's another study which makes actually a complete classification of systems that have additional symmetries, um, spatial, two, uh, spatial twofold symmetries, where these parameters may, may or may not behave in this way. This is what we can use to um, extract a classification for our kinds of system. So let me go through this. So here's again the full table. Now, there are some cases which are simple. So if I only have time reversal and no other symmetries, I don't care about how the system behaves under particle hole symmetry. In that case, the table is the same because under time reversal symmetry, um, I do get the sign change as I would in the normal case. So the rows where I don't have any additional symmetry, I can just extract from the usual table. There's another case. So that would give me these um, three rows. Another case that's also sort of simple is when I only have particle hole symmetry. 
if I have particle hole symmetry, phi doesn't depend like a quasi momentum, but rather like a spatial coordinate. But as I said, we can include a spatial coordinate in this classification, and it's just delta k, uh, dk minus dr, so the number of spatial dimensions. That means in this case, I just have to read the table backwards with a minus sign for all the entries. So this adds two more lines to my classification. So the line the A, I can read either way. Class A, because I don't have the symmetry, so I can use this classification or the other. And since it uh, has a periodicity too, it doesn't matter in which direction I read it, so I get the same. C and D, which only have um, um, particle hole symmetry, so I just um, read this backwards and I get the two entries. So the ones that are more complicated are the classes that do have a chiral symmetry, because those do, do not enter in any of these um, um, cases of the um, of the usual table. So the work by Shiyosaki and Sato that I uh, mentioned um, considered systems which do or do not have the usual symmetries, but in addition, in addition have all the two spatial symmetries, such as a mirror or a twofold rotation. And, and uh, these symmetries, not all components of K and R have to depend on the same way. So you may have some that behave in the usual way, so that means they don't change sign for K under a unitary symmetry like chiral symmetry, um, or they do change sign um, under an anti-unitary symmetry such as the particle hole symmetry. And then there are the red ones that behave anomalously under these additional symmetries. So if we use this classification, we can actually apply it to our junctions in the sense that we only have these anomalous parameters. So we say all our phi's behave like this k parallel and all the other um, parameters just don't exist in our system. So that means if I take a look at these classes, well, the only usual symmetry is time reversal. So if I have only time reversal and not part of the whole or chiral symmetry, the corresponding class would be this one. So A3 doesn't have time reversal, so it's A. Um, BD1 has um, a time reversal expressed to one, which corresponds to class A1. If it has a time reversal expressed to minus one, it um, corresponds to A2. And then I have this additional symmetry, which um, is um, determined by um, these rows. So for um, class A3, I only have one additional unitary symmetry that gives the chiral symmetry, whereas um, for the other four classes, I have an additional anti-unitary symmetry, which then gives me also the, the chiral one, which is a combination of the two, um, um, under which this phi is an anomalous parameter. And then I can um, go back to their paper and figure out what are the corresponding entries for all of um, these phases to see what we can get in our system. And it actually turns out that three of these additional classes are always trivial. So you cannot realize any topological phase um, within these symmetries, whereas the other two um, have new topological indices. So I can add those to the ones I already established. So this is the full table of possible um, topological phases in these multiple junctions where I have an Hamiltonian that only depends on this variable phi. Um, so the ones I already discussed um, fall nicely into this table. So the um, churn insulator in um, conventional junctions is characterized by an index C, so a churn number. Um, and it's a system that has only particle hold symmetry. Time reversal needs to be broken. Um, yes, is there a question? Why does this uh, to minus one? Um, um, sorry, I'm just confused. No, no, C is the C is the usual um, um, case without spin orbit coupling. Oh, spin orbit coupling. Okay. So C is without spin orbit coupling. <laughs> so it's just a conventional BCS as wave superconductor without spin orbit coupling. 
in that case, you get C. If you add spin orbit coupling, you go to class D, and actually you get uh, two C um, classification. And um, we studied in our uh, junctions, if we add spin orbit coupling perturbatively, actually it, it doesn't change the classification. However, it goes to 2C. I already showed you, you have, uh, we have a, a quantized conductance, which is uh, quantified um, in units of 4E squared over H. And one of the factors two actually comes just by adding up the two spins. And once you have spin orbit coupling, you can't consider the two spins um, separately anymore. So you directly get the 2C um, classification, which con um, contains the two spin species. So both classes can be described by, by what, what I showed you before. Okay, so the thing we, um, well, there's lots of entries to be explored still. Well, actually, um, well, there's nothing in two terminal junctions, no interesting gapped phases in um, two terminal, uh, in three terminal junctions, so with the phi equal two, there's the two cases we already explored. I don't know any superconducting examples for A2 and C2, so I don't know what to do about those. There's another entry in a system without symmetry, and there's actually um, similar proposal or related proposals how to explore these by not using these, uh, the Andreev spectrum of um, choses and junctions, but networks of choses and junctions where you can play with charges and faces and where you can break all the symmetries and realize these kind of offense structures that would be um, characterized by CMX. So in some ways, this has already been done. So the new interesting things that can possibly be explored is from the equal three and, and upward. And the one we did look at so far is an example of a C2 phase now in class um, C. Again, I don't know of any superconducting examples for D classes. If someone knows them, uh, let me know. I'd be interested in discussing. So what's this um, C2 phase? Well, again, um, we can just look at four terminal junctions and look at band structures, but you can't see the index from the band structure. So it's hard to figure out if it's topological or not. The easiest way to get at a topological phase is to look for a phase transition. So if I want to uh, have a, a tolerable phase in um, a three dimension, I basically have to look at a phase transition in four dimensions or in with one additional control parameter. So what I can look for are protected gap closings in five terminal junctions. So I have four parameters. And then at the end, I say one of them is my control parameter and I get a gapped topological phase in three dimensions. So similar as before, 2D churn insulator, 3D vital point. So in that case, we again can look at an effective low um, energy Hamiltonian. It turns out two by two is not sufficient. As we said, if you have two by two, we have three Pauli matrices and not more. So if we want to get um, four um, matrices that anti-commute, then give us our spectrum, we have to have at least a 40 representation uh, for dimension, uh, uh, 40 um, structure of this low energy Hamiltonian. So that means we need two bands. It's not just a single band that crosses, but we need two bands to cross at the Fermi level. So in that case, if we have these four matrices as the anti-commute, our spectrum is um, just the sum of the squares of the coefficient, and um, we have a linear opening in all of the four directions. So one example, and I show you later how we obtained it, is shown here, where you have this crossing at zero, you see the two bands, the full band structure in the end is more complicated and the bands don't stay um, degenerate. Now, if you look at the symmetries in this class, actually these four matrices are not the only ones that are allowed. Before I said for my two by two systems, I just have three poly matrices and that's all. Here, if I look at a system which has particle hole symmetry, there's actually 10 for, the, um, this for, for, the, um, for my four matrices that would respect um, particle hole symmetry. So in what sense is my crossing protected? So let's see what happens if we add these other matrices. I won't add all of them. We can do the calculation, but just look at an example. So the specificity of these new matrices that I didn't add is, is that they actually don't anti-commute with all of the matrices that I already have. I can't add a fifth matrix that anti-commutes with everyone. So the one I add will commute with some of the matrices. And because of that, actually, we don't get new terms. <laughs> This additional mass term or this additional perturbation to my Hamiltonian will um, 
split my four band crossing in a point into a line of points where two bands cross at the Fermi level, but it won't open up a gap. So what's, what's shown here, whoop. Ah, sorry, the wrong direction. It's here that now I have a line of gap closings between, between two of the bands, but if I go sufficiently far away from this line of gap closings, I still have my phase transition between two different, topologically different um, gapped phases. Um, I think my time is um, almost up. So we have two examples how we identified uh, systems that actually have such um, gap crossings. The one is basically uh, what Pierre Latef did is a brute force <laughs> search between the scattering rate phases to find one that locally gets this um, low energy Hamiltonian. And he found some class of matrices that do that. I have no idea how. And that's the spectrum I showed you. We can also make an effective model with um, um, quantum dots, particularly if we have two um, spin, two dots or two um, spin degenerate levels, the most general low energy Hamiltonian when the superconducting um, um, gap is to, um, considered the largest energy scale in the problem is um, given here. And then I can look at how I can tune these different parameters. So I have the on-site energies. I have tunneling between my two levels. There can either be a direct process, but that does, wouldn't depend on the phase of the superconductor. So if I want to have a tunable parameter, I have to take into account um, elastic co-tunneling through superconductors. And actually I get a fairly complicated eff uh, effective terminal that allows me to get a phase control of this process. And I have Andreev reflections, which are the gammas, which can either happen on the same level or like a cross process um, between the two levels. And again, if I want to control these two independently, I can't just use one superconductor, but I need several superconductors with adjusted phases to control um, them individually. So the quantum dot model gets fairly complicated. I need, um, I think, uh, I need over 10 superconductors in the end to, to make this. So this is not a realistic model. It's just to show that we can devise <laughs> something that works. And in that case, we also do get um, these protected crossings and uh, linear spectrum um, around them. So let me um, conclude. What I showed you today is this analogy between um, Andreev um, spectra and um, band structures of materials. We showed that we can get um, analogs of some uh, known um, topological phases. And we performed a classification of all possible phases. We found one additional example, but there are lots of open questions in particular. Is there a system that would realize this rather than this um, very irrealistic models that I showed you in the end? And also what is the signature of such a CC2 invariant rather than just looking at and crossings in these systems. So thank you for your attention. Questions, please. No, no. <laughs> Here, so the internet. Internet area. Um, so, did you you mention at some at one point spatial symmetries, right? And um, I guess with you, we would need three terminals to two dimensions to have two phases. And yes, because it's phase and Do you have anything like a reality condition? Can you implement a reality condition like like a C to C to Z times time reverse condition where your Hamiltonian is real in some basis? I'm not sure. You mean that that a, a local time reversal symmetry rather than the usual one? Well, it would be a combined time reversal with in in momentum systems. It would or it would it would leave the momentum invariant. Okay. But imposed because this would have this would get your vials in two dimensions. Indeed, we didn't look at any. Um, Symmetries between terminals. So spatial symmetries would involve um, specific properties on the scattering matrices, which we didn't look at at all. We, we assumed we have only this um, particle hole and time reversal symmetries, and we don't impose special conditions onto the terminals, which would probably not make it robust to 
in the innovations, group, but in, in the group structure, you don't have does the spatial symmetry stays the same, right? Commutation and anti-commutation relations. But with these other symmetries, it could be different. Like you get projected. I, I assume if you have additional symmetries, you can get uh, different. Uh, yes, but uh, we yeah we should discuss. But uh, we didn't look at it. Okay, thanks. Uh, have you thought about how the classification has changed by interactions? Uh, no. I mean, in some way, as I said, we're doing single particle physics. <laughs> we don't have a Fermi C. What can change or interactions are, can be incorporated in, in, in different ways. You can think about just having um, some capacitances, which, make the, which mean that your phases will fluctuate and not be just an externally imposed parameter anymore, um, which would be interesting because then you have a conjugate variable to play with. You can think about defects and boundaries. <laughs> um, how the, the spectrum will change with interactions, we didn't think about But yeah, in the end, it's a question of spectrum. But I know that there are interesting things happen to the Andrea spectra and in presence of interactions, but no, we didn't so, so, look somehow, at it specifically. Somehow I suspect it's an even simpler problem than this, <laughs> because it's essentially zero dimensional. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you just take a dot with a local, uh, with a uh, with a local repulsion, if your central region is the dot, you can get in some regions you know how to compute the Andrea spectra, and then you can look at just the band structure again. So that's something that can be explored. Uh, how do you include disorder into it? Um, disorder is actually the fact that we have a scattering matrix in, in the central region. So the, the, the interesting thing is we don't need any fine tuning of the scattering matrix. If we have one realization of the disorder yeah. in the system. Oh, what I mean, uh, how does it enter into the Hamiltonian D, D description? Uh, you, you who have basically a Hamiltonian which they, they, they happens on several conserved quantities uh who, who, how it will look like when, when you include the d d disorder so we we include well we have a system that can be described by a scattering matrix and a, the given scattering matrix will depend on the realization of of disorder and from that scattering matrix we construct the hamiltonian so for some realizations of disorder as you say, we would get these wild points. For others, we wouldn't, so for different scattering matrices. But if we have them, if you make small changes to the system, they will be robust again, because you need to merge two of them. But so the parameters of my Hamiltonian will depend on the specific realization of, you say, the disorder in, in, in the junctions of the, the, the specific scattering matrix of the junction. But for, for instance, in uh... In in most uh, st standard cake standard cases, in inclusion of the the disorder would be like to 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 add some v term or to to add some random uh, random gauge pa pa potential, and here there is no obvious way to move to move. Modify the Hamiltonian. No, I mean we have really a, a, the, the the form of the Hamiltonian will depend on what the scattering matrix is, and um, sometimes we do get the, these states, and sometimes we, we do need disorder. If the junction is completely ballistic, you will never couple all the different terminals anyway. So the, the system needs to be the chaotic or random, okay. so so you actually connect all the terminals, but then uh, the specifics. Um, okay, thanks. So there's no. I don't know of a simple way to go directly from the scattering matrix to the low energy Hamiltonian. But... I think that maybe this question about disorder. So basically, one can think of uh, well, when you're talking about disorder in Hamiltonian, you think about some randomness in eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. But uh, in that description, you have unitary matrix, and you can look at eigenvalues of the unitary matrix. Unitary matrix is uh, disordered. 
the proper ensemble. Okay. And there is some relation between basically between the eigenvalues of unitary matrix okay. Okay. and the Newtonian. <laughs> Uh, so in this respect, we can classify the same way the unitary matrix. Yes, it is. I think that's basically that. Is it correct? Yes. <coughs> One very last question, and I... <laughs> Want to say sorry, there was some uh, that at the end of the session we have yeah. Uh, I had one question that when you said uh, by putting this uh, random scattering matrices, you can get five percent of this uh, while points. So I had this question that can you get more than one while points, and depending on the chirality of the bands, you can get probably chan number of more than one. Is that like, if you have a sense? well, if I have a as I said, the, the if if my system has time reversal invariant and and the the random scattering matrices that I show were for time reversal invariant systems, if I get a while point, I get at least four while points. Um, to get something which has a higher churn number in the end, a cut that has a higher churn number than one, I need more than one channel. So if I have scattering matrices in some higher dimensional space, I get easily while points, and I can get churn numbers that. Can go up to whatever I like, but I have a dense and wave spectrum, so it will be much harder to see in the end that I actually did realize them. But yes. Okay, let's send Julia again. Julia, there is a question online. Ah. <laughs> How do you observe the edge states? We don't have edges in the system. Actually, it's a zero dimensional system. So the, the, the phi variable is strictly periodic if we don't include interaction effects. If we play with charges, which is our conjugate to phase and superconductors, we would have an inhomogeneous system. However, I don't know how to engineer a sharp edge and that's what's needed to get a real edge state. So we don't have edge states. So we basically, it, in some ways it's more similar to a uh, topological pump. So we just probe the, the interior internal structure and don't play with the edges to, to observe the topological properties. Thank you. I'll try the second time. Right. So now it's Share, share the screen. Um, yeah. Is that my microphone is still on? Yeah.